I'd like to get started if we could. First of all, let me just say how absolutely thrilled I am to see this crowd. This is awesome. So I would like to welcome our faculty, our dean, our distinguished guests, our staff, our students. Um, good afternoon. This is uh, my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the official kickoff of our year-long celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at WSU. If, if you've been around the department lately, you will have noticed that there are light post banners out in front of the building that displays throughout the department have been given a facelift, and new displays, both analog and digital, have been added to commemorate the occasion. This year's Distinguished Colloquium Series, including today's presentation, will feature some of our own current emeritus and senior faculty, speaking about the history and the personalities that go along with the legacy of scientific achievement in each of their careers. I want to thank Robin Stratton in particular for all of her work and for coordinating the work of others, including me and many of our faculty, staff, and students. And I want to particularly mention uh, Hardik, and Pravir, and Jeeves, and Marin, and, 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 and Sean, and Zara, and I'm forgetting people, and I'm sorry, but I really appreciate all the work that everybody in the department put in to really spiffing the place up for this, for this event. Um, our goals here are to show reverence for the distinguished history of our department, and to celebrate our accomplishments, but also to look to the next hundred years to convey the excitement of doing cutting edge scientific research, the eternal durability of our discipline in preparing students to be critical thinkers and problem solvers, and the desire to engage our tremendous and vibrant community of stakeholders here in Pullman, at our other campuses across the state, across the country, and indeed the world. So I put these pictures up during the State of the Department talk a couple of weeks ago. It bears repeating that these people Paul Anderson, William Band, and George Duvall have stood out to me as not only great physicists, but people who were instrumental in building the department during its first hundred years. I think today's speaker has that in common with me. By the way, I sincerely hope that whoever stands here in my place in another hundred years is looking up at a group that includes some women and people of color. <laughs> It is especially significant for me, as this department welcomed me as a member only two and a half years ago, to have had the opportunity to learn some of our history, to adopt it as my own, and with any luck, to make some small contribution to it. Two of these guys are department chairs, and I hear their voices all the time. <laughs> Don't screw it up. <laughs> all three. So I'm here to introduce today's speaker. My introduction comes by way of a dedication. It's my great privilege today to formally dedicate the newly redecorated space for our physics majors on the 12th floor of this building as the J. Thomas Dickinson Undergraduate Study. <laughs> so after Tom's talk, there'll be a reception just outside the building. The weather seems to be cooperating. There will also be an opportunity to visit the study, which has a display case with some photos and other items from Tom's career here. Please go in small groups, as there's not a huge amount of space up there. Um, on the door to the study is this plaque, which reads, J. Thomas Dickinson, professor in the Washington State University Department of Physics and Astronomy for nearly half a century. That's half our history, folks. Conducted a world-class research program in surface physics. He was awarded fellowship in the American Physical Society in 2002, quote, for his pioneering and innovative work in basic bond breaking mechanisms and the forces on particles at solid surfaces during mechanical or radiative stimulation, end quote. Beloved by countless students as a teacher, mentor, and friend, he championed the department's undergraduate program, establishing an endowment prior to his retirement that perpetually supports research opportunities for undergraduate students. This study is dedicated to the preservation of Professor Dickinson's legacy of accomplishment and service to our department. So with that, 
Thank you very much. You're very welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, two facts. One, I am not 100 years old. <laughs> and second, it used to be called the student lounge because that's where they went to sleep. <laughs> but I, I hope they'll go there to study. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this photograph, this set of photographs, has been uh, put together by Robin to show some of the highlights of our uh, history and current, current activity. And I think j just a few of these people should be pointed out to you. Here's Michael Allen uh, with this uh, amazing picture of a student, a young student, uh, probably seeing the surface of the moon or something, or something really exciting. And that really speaks to the heart of what at least our educational duties are, and that is to incite that curiosity that the student should have. Uh, <clears throat> this is, this is uh, me. A student had put a scratch into a vacuum system surface that should not have had a scratch. You see, I'm really ticked off. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Here's Matt McCluskey. Um, there's a torch here, uh, the student, uh, Marina. Uh, I think they're roasting a piece of zinc oxide. Over here is Mark Kuzik, and this is his son, Mark. <clears throat> um, Mark Kuzik, the elder, was too cheap to put him into a university somewhere else. <laughs> <clears throat> so he had to go here. Uh, he lived at home. And, and what he's saying to him is, did you take out the garbage? <laughs> uh, here we have, the, of course, the famous pumpkin drop, which we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, <clears throat> we have our heroes, Bill Band and uh, Anderson, which we'll talk about. And <clears throat> here um, are two of our physicists, our astrophysicists, falling into black holes. <laughs> You can't see them because they're black holes. OK, so what about zinc oxide? <clears throat> well, this is again showing some of our illustrious faculty. We, we happen to all have been studying zinc oxide at the same time. Zinc oxide has a tremendous amount of number of important parameters in terms of the physics and applications. Uh, we were interested in optical properties. And I talked them into putting the zinc oxide on the nose for the picture. And uh, there's a couple of people who wouldn't, who wouldn't join us. So uh, <laughs> it's their loss. Now, let's start from the very beginning. <clears throat> the very beginning is that uh, WSU, or not WSU, the Washington Agricultural College Experimental Station School of Science was where we actually started. And this was way back in uh, 1890. And this came out of the Morrell, uh, Morrill Act, which uh, started up a whole bunch of state universities. And we were uh, luck luckily to be in, in on that. Secondly, uh, very quickly after that, uh, the legislature picked Pullman as the college location. Now, <clears throat> this was a big fight. Realized this was going to be agriculturally related. It was going to be on the, the, the east side of the state. And so towns like Yakima and Walla Walla were all fighting to get this university. So there were other institutions that were going to be placed in these various cities. And Walla Walla and Pullman really came to, to fighting this. And according to Al Butler, this is what he told me, that Walla Walla won. <laughs> <laughs> they got to stay prison. 
Now, the reason they wanted the prison rather than the school was you know how the riffraff the, the students make up. <laughs> That's Al Butler's story. <clears throat> okay, the first president uh, was uh, George Lilly. Uh, happened very quickly and very soon um, the school was opened and <clears throat> there were 13 college students and 14, 46 students who weren't really ready yet, but we took them anyway. <clears throat> we're still doing that, by the way. <clears throat> uh, now, uh, Lily actually taught some math and physics. And so he was our re the, really the first uh, physics instructor in the, in the uh, school. Uh, <clears throat> he was president for only one year. He got in trouble um, with the regents. And um, the result was that the students got very angry because they liked this guy. And so the, the new president was um, Heston. They, they pelted him with rotten cabbages eggs and snowballs um, because they were so angry. And this is a letter they wrote saying it was not Lily's fault that they threw all these things at the, uh, <laughs> the people. Well, um, it did get changed uh, into a college, and that was uh, a few years later, 1905. And uh, <coughs> the university status came quite late. Uh, it was in 1959, which is surprisingly late. But uh, that's when we actually became uh, a university. The first uh, full-time physics instructor was uh, Brenton Steele. And this was in 1910. We really didn't have a department yet. And this is the campus in 1910. So in just those few years, they had put up these, these buildings. Um, he became the first department chair when we became a department, which was 100 years ago. And so that was in 1919. <clears throat> now, uh, you probably know that uh, some of these buildings should look familiar to you. Here's a recent picture. And you can see Bryan Tower here and Thompson Hall right here with the turret uh, still on campus. And of course, the only reason <coughs> that these um, uh, still exist is because of renovations. Renovations was a big thing uh, on campus. And if you walk around, you'll see these, these uh, older buildings. Now, one of them is right across the street. <coughs> it's uh, Brian, uh, excuse me, Troy Hall right here, which is, uh, had been and, and uh, is currently part of chemistry and some other, uh, it was part of other departments, of course. And that was in 1924 when it uh, actually uh, was finished construction. And then uh, in the 15s and 16s, um, just a few years ago, they started renovating it. Now the amazing thing is, of course, I walked by here every day and I saw this building being renovated. The entire building was, was totally uh, torn apart inside. All that was left was this shell. There's no roof right here. And the only way they could keep this thing from falling over was these big steel struts to, to hold the walls together while they finished uh, the restoration. Horrendous expense. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wonder if we will ever renovate a building again. I'm serious, because of the expense that went into this particular building. Um, so uh, this is what it looks like today. You just go outside and look at it. And if you peek around the corner, there is a modern uh, section of it, which is very, very nice. Uh, it would be very nice if they could keep renovating, but I just don't know if they'll be able to do it. Uh, <clears throat> that brings us to our building. <clears throat> um, if you talk to faculty members and get them to be honest, most of them really aren't very much in love with this building. 
And that was pretty much true right from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> if you're an experimentalist, what you found is that this building is an inverted pendulum. It sways. Well, in addition to that, there's all kinds of vibrations that are generated. And if you're sensitive to vibrations, which any decent physics experiment is, <laughs> then you suffer. And I had experiments that I had to go down here into the basement, actually back where the, <coughs> uh, do they know about the organ? Back in, there's a theater organ in, this, in the uh, big Albert, uh, um, Al Butler Hall. And there's some space in there. And we set up our experiments and ran them uh, to get rid of the vibrations. So uh, it was a problem. Well, <coughs> It initially was not going to be this tall building. Uh, the original design was like this. <laughs> I had to show it quickly. I didn't know what to do here. It actually was going to be a, a very low building, I think about four or five floors at the most, spread out uh, in, in a long direction. But of course, that took up a big footprint, and so they wanted to save space and so they decided to, to go up. Now the person who suffered the most from this decision was Miles Dresser. <clears throat> Miles Dresser was um, a surface scientist by the way and <clears throat> the thing that he got stuck with was being chairman of the building committee and he started with this basic plan and was forced to move over into this plan. It was an enormous task to do that. Uh, you, there's a lot of details that I won't go into, but it was a very difficult task. And Miles gave up a lot of his time to get us into this building uh, as it is. So we, we do have to appreciate that. Now the real reason for building this very tall building was, in fact, to host the Punkman Drive. <laughs> <clears throat> it didn't take long before the students and the faculty realized, you've got to throw things off the top of this building. <clears throat> <clears throat> Preferably not alive. <laughs> and the Punkman Drive <clears throat> became a tradition which uh, is, is enormously popular. The crowd shown here is large, but believe me, that's increased every year. And <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, right up here is the window where we were dropping from. Now, we had <clears throat> a president, Elson Floyd, who some of you remember, who was asked to come and drop some pumpkins. <clears throat> He came and he was, he gave a little talk down here at the bottom, then he went up there. And he took one look out that window and they had to force him <laughs> to, to stay there to drop the pumpkin. I'm serious. They, they had to hang onto his belt and promise him he would not fall. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the impact of watching <clears throat> the experiment that they do every year was the big pumpkin and the little pumpkin dropped at the same time, hitting at the same time. And these, these students were good. It, those things really came in together. Was it was an enormous uh, impact on, on young people and people who may not really understand Newton's laws. And, uh, Probably the equivalent um, image is the uh, Apollo uh, mission where they drop the feather and the, and the hammer together and they come down together because there's the air, there's no, there's no atmosphere. So it really, uh, that particular demonstration, I think, was, was very, very effective. And of course, they had a lot of fun. This, this is... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Fran Morrissey, 
acting as Galileo, and this is Butch acting as Butch. <laughs> okay, so here it is, the top of the building. This was during con construction. They finally got up there, <clears throat> and um, people wanted to go up there as soon as the building was finished, and so the department actually had a platform built with a railing, uh, and you could go up there by getting permission from the office. We were letting people go up there all the time. And <clears throat> it was uh, before all the rules and regulations, of course, kept that from happening. So in 1980, uh, in May, I came into work uh, on the weekend, and <clears throat> I noticed that it was getting very stormy. I mean, it was in the, in the west, it was just dark. And I thought, wow, well, I better get, get there before you know, lightning and everything happens. Walked in the door, and there was a geologist, a student. And he said, boy, oh, sorry, that was about the building. <laughs> <laughs> One quick reversal. This is the tallest building in the state of Washington. If you include the 2,400 feet of altitude, <laughs> <laughs> we're way above Seattle. <laughs> OK. Mount St. Helens, blue. And uh, just to give you an impression, this is near Othello. Where, uh, which is north uh, east of, of the mountain, uh, as the dust cloud came. This is Pullman in the early afternoon. You can see the lights came on. Uh, people, it was dark. <laughs> it was very dark. And, uh, <clears throat> The uh, impact on the uh, community was, e was enormous, while well, the whole part, the whole west or east side of the state. But th you can see what was lost in the mountain. This is before and after. You can see that the, ca the catastrophic effect of the blast, which, which uh, knocked down the timber, uh, <clears throat> a good physics problem would be to look at the flow uh, in the way the timber fell. And so those of you in fluids, uh, Marston, get busy, <laughs> can figure that out. But there were some interesting things like that. Uh, this shows you the ash fall very close to the mountain. This is Spirit Lake, which was full of wood. Uh, this is campus. We had a, about it was less than an inch, but it seemed like about four feet. Uh, it, was, it was just a, uh, enough to really be miserable. Uh, this poor fellow was trying to shovel the stuff. Lifting a shovel, a, a snow shovel, that was the obvious thing to use. Everybody used snow shovels. You could barely lift it. It was so heavy. It was very high density. And uh, yards looked like this, and of course, People, this is Ash Monday delivers anxiety and so on. This is up in Spokane. <laughs> Finals were canceled. <laughs> and so there we were wondering, how are we going to grade without the final? Well, we did the best we could. And I think, in general, the students made out better than they would have <laughs> that particular year. <clears throat> The chemical composition of the ash uh, was, was studied. Uh, this particular paper came out in uh, 1980, uh, November. And you can see it was mostly silica, alumina, some iron oxide, and then these, these other oxides. Now, <clears throat> we had a uh, faculty member, Peter Brynlich, who was an expert in what's called thermoluminescence. And his 
colleague, Ansgar Schmidt, came down to my office. This was a, a day or two later. And said, come on, Peter's going to do an experiment. He wants us to be witnesses. <laughs> so we went into a dark room. We had a hot plate. And Peter took some of the ash and put it on the hot plate. And he said, did you see it? <laughs> and Anskar and I looked, I realized we're in the dark. <laughs> and I said, no, I didn't see anything. Anskar said he didn't. Peter said, didn't you see it? So I said, do it again. Did it again, same results. Finally, we convinced him that uh, it, it was the placebo effect or something. <laughs> he wanted to see light. <laughs> there was no light. <laughs> and, and the likely cause of why there was no light, let me just mention, if you take these kinds of materials and, <clears throat> and break them up and, or irradiate them or do damaging things to them, they will luminesce when you heat them up. But it was probably the heat that was occurring during the explosion and the expansion of the plume that uh, led to no, to, to no luminescence. But, <clears throat> so uh, no fizz rev letter or whatever that, that would have given. This is what it looks like uh, now. This would be uh, in a little earlier than right this moment. It'd be like in uh, July. Uh, so there's, there is regrowth coming back. Uh, occasionally, you'll, you'll see a tree. Um, and that's what nature's going to do. And uh, that's what it should do. And realize that this was not the first time that the, the volcano blew up. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> having seen it in the earlier stages where trees all over the place, uh, that, that's what nature does. OK, so back to the research um, in the department. Um, this is a timeline that shows um, some of the early research. And this, this is Paul Anderson's work on uh, metals, which we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, this is some work he did uh, with Fitzsimmons on electron microscopy. Uh, this is the wartime work. It goes on. Uh, <clears throat> this was some X-ray spectroscopy work that was done by Stevenson, uh, another of our early heroes. Uh, this is the the work that was done by Bill Band uh, in the uh, 50s and 60s, and <clears throat> uh, Paul also did a lot of work in in biophysics, and so this line here represents that work that was uh, after, after the war. And I just put in here just as a statement that there was then a continuation of the surface science work that was led by people like Dan Bills, Ed Donaldson, Dresser, myself, Sandstrom, Tom Thomas, and Dave Styers. Some of these names are familiar to a few of you. So th the, the beginnings of surface science that, that Anderson was able to get started here, uh, led to uh, hirings and so on, that they continued to do that, that, that type of work. Um, so I'd like to just say a few words uh, initially about, about him. Um, <clears throat> he um, was, uh, received his bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois that's supposed to be a nine. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you understand. <laughs> he got his PhD in physics in 800. <laughs> uh, he spent a year in London. Uh, he was employed by Eastman Kodak. He was chair of physics. Uh, or, or related some p higher positions in, in the Yanjing University in China. Uh, he was uh, a research fellow at Harvard under Bridgman and also uh, uh, went to Berlin under, under this fellowship uh, at the Physikalische Technische Reichenstalt 
and then he came to WSC in 1931. And this is a picture of, of Paul at, uh, <coughs> in the presence of a, a microscope that they built, and this is him uh, doing some experiments. Okay, so um, I think this would be a good time to, to, to really get some more information about Paul in a way that I don't think, I, I just can't do it. I can't do it. But his son can. Please welcome his son, Jim Henderson. <laughs> Well, the first thing you learn is never follow Tom Dickinson. Because <laughs> you, there's, it's impossible to, to keep up with this. But there are some humorous anecdotes that I would like to put in this moment. And you know, this is a statement about what actually happened. Um, just before he graduated from the University of Illinois, he actually signed up for the Navy uh, flight school in Key West, Florida, no less, where they were flying Curtis Jennies on uh, floats. So he did all the training. He crashed an airplane, broke his nose, but it wasn't his fault. So he was passed, and they were headed for Europe. In the middle of the Atlantic, uh, the armistice was signed. So they turned around and came back. He finished, then he worked with T.W. Richards at Harvard, and um, he fell in love at that point, and his girlfriend was quite well to do, so he decided he needed a, a job that paid well. That's why he went to Eastman Kodak. He spent two years at Eastman Kodak, but her parents had started primary schools in China, and so that's what drew him to China, and they actually, he, he was called the first dean of physics, which is comparable to our chairs. And his son was born in 1928, and his first wife died a week afterwards. And so he left with the baby to head back to Tacoma, where the maternal grandparents were. And Bill Band replaced him. So that was the, the, the first intricate link in, in all of this. Um, so he settled in Tacoma for a while, and then uh, Percy Bridgman offered him this National Research Fellowship. He went to Harvard for maybe a month and then skipped on to Berlin. And, and of course, it's, as you know, Bridgman uh, was a high-pressure physicist. Um, but my dad heard about the electron microscope. He was coming back through Cambridge, Massachusetts, headed for Tacoma when Bridgman said, you know, the chairmanship of WSC physics departments opened up. So he was on his way driving by, so he, he uh, interviewed, and there were a few hundred applicants. That's how, this is the bottom of the Depression. It was really grim. Um, but they offered him the position, and so he um, took on the chairmanship with the great intention, which was largely realized, to build a spectacular physics department. And Clarence Zener was one uh, example. Um, but during the 1930s, he actually received this letter um, expressing profound concern that um, smoke was detected in his office. This is from the president of the University of Holland. Moreover, there were cigarette butts discovered in his waste paper basket. So, it's, you know, I mean, he shouldn't have been smoking, of course, but that wasn't the point. Um, but Phil Abelson was his, uh, a uh, student of his. How many of you know about Phil Abelson? Okay, well, he was the mastermind in the separation of uranium isotopes for the Manhattan Project, and he was an undergraduate here. But Phil Abelson decided to stay down in the trailer park um, and, and rent this trailer. And so <laughs> President Holland 
expressed to my father serious concern about what Phil Abelson was doing down in that trailer court and suggested that two of them go down. And my dad said, you mean visit him unannounced and knock on his door? Yes, that's what we're going to do. And my dad was going, oh, jeez. <laughs> so they knock on the door and open it. Here's Phil bending over his books. He looked up and he said, oh, hi. He was studying physics. <laughs> Holland said, oh, OK, I guess it's all right. And my dad said, I hope we never do this again. <laughs> So then the Second World War arrived and my father got very involved in radar, first working with Ed Purcell on radar to aid landing of aircraft. But he got wind of the fact that they had detected the Japanese at the tip of the Aleutian Islands, but from Northern California. And he started thinking, how could that be? So he started doing research using the moisture gradient as a waveguide to steer radar over the horizon and spent the rest of the war in the South Pacific and the Philippines and New Guinea extending the radar range from 250 miles to 700 miles to completely change the complexion of the Second World War because it allowed them to know exactly what was, what was happening. And um, so he came back from the Second World War and, and the Navy contracts built the infrastructure, the experimental aspect of the physics department and the old lathes, drill presses, band saws, and so on ended up in our basement. So I grew up with all of these machine tools in a dark room and everything else, which was a huge help to me in the long run. And in 1949, he had an offer from the University of Michigan, a big biophysics program there, but he was in the midst of building a cabin up in northern Idaho, which is where I'm staying right now. He was halfway through it, and I think it was the cabin that tipped the balance. He had to finish that project, but uh, he loved WSC, then WSU, and he always said, it doesn't matter where the students are, the best ones are at WSU, and they're also the nicest ones. And so, thank you. Thank you. You never want to follow Jim. <laughs> well, <clears throat> another reason you don't want to follow him is because what's next is physics. <laughs> and uh, half the room are not physicists. <laughs> I'm going to cut through some of these quicker because we, we are a little short on time. So I need to tell you about one of the one of the properties that, that was so important at the time in measuring about metal surfaces. <clears throat> and what it was was what's called the work function. And to be very uh, simplistic about it, if you look at where the electrons live in terms of energy uh, in the metal, they, they tend to uh, float around in this box that you might call the electron gas. And the energies <clears throat> distribute themselves up to a level which is uh, <clears throat> at low temperatures is the, what's called the Fermi level of the, of the metal. Now, to get out of the metal, there's a barrier. And that barrier <clears throat> has a height which is called the work function. It's an old term and we've just adopted it and kept it. But it's an energy that if you were to take an electron right at this level right here and, and, and somehow hit it with, with the energy equal to this quantity phi, the electron would be able to escape. So that's, that's what he was measuring in all of these experiments. Now, the... Uh, types of numbers, uh, the units are electron volts, which for physics people is very comfortable. And I've got, I just took out of the uh, handbook uh, a set of 
values, this is towards the end of the periodic table. So this is uh, <coughs> zirconium, zinc, yttrium, tungsten, vanadium, uranium. So these are heavy metals. And the work functions are on the order of four, three electron volts, like that. And <clears throat> these are the different methods that are used to get these values. And you'll notice that for tungsten, um, or let's, let's say I'm trying to find one. Yeah, these are all polycrystals here. Um, you can find that these numbers change uh, for the same element. And that's because it depends on things like what the orientation of the crystal is. These methods here, <coughs> um, all but the field emission method, were methods that, that Anderson used. He used photo emission, so he shined light on a surface to get the electrons to come out. Uh, he used what's called the contact potential difference and also thermionic emission. And uh, because of time, I won't have uh, the time to go through all the details, but I can I give you a little bit of that. But um, for the physics people, I just want you to think in these terms. In atomic physics, there's an energy called the ionization potential. And the first ionization potential is the lowest energy it takes to take an electron from the orbits of the uh, atom into the vacuum. So if you uh, have a hydrogen atom, uh, there's only one electron. It takes 13.6 electron volts, which is a lot. Cesium is low, about 3.89. And the work function of cesium metal, by the way, is, is 2.1 eV. Now, <clears throat> an astounding thing is shown here, that if you go through all the metals, you'll notice that the work function is approximately one half the value of the ionization energy of the atom. And you, <clears throat> you take some of the the best solid state physicists in the world, and you ask them, why is that? You know what they'll tell you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's an astounding thing. And uh, when I learned this a long time ago, I asked one of our solid state physicists, and he told me he had no idea. So uh, it, I can tell you why it's smaller, but that, that, that's all. <laughs> OK, so um, to get electrons out, you can shine light on, on the surface. Uh, this shows you the uh, one simple experiment where you're shining uh, light onto the, uh, the metal and it's ejecting electrons. And you can measure the energy of the electrons by just changing a voltage across these, t these two electrodes and therefore measure the, the minimum energy it takes uh, to stop all of the electrons. And that's equal to the work function. So uh, to uh, get you to the, uh, the physics of this, we go to Einstein, because Einstein figured this out. In, and in particular, <clears throat> uh, told people that the, the photon has the energy that is related to the frequency of the light or the wavelength of the light. And th actually, this is the Planck equation here. And But knowing that, <clears throat> you could treat the photon as a bullet. You shoot the bullet at the surface, and it pops out an electron. And using that type of physics, you're able to measure these, these uh, th uh, the work function. So. Um, I'll skip this and get you to the uh, equation for the work function. So you're measuring, uh, this is the voltage you're applying to push the electrons back. And w when you get zero value uh, for the current, you're, you're able to calculate uh, the, work, the work function. OK. so. Um, The problem with all this is that you can't do this in air. 
because the metal is very, very sensitive to the gases in the air and you get chemistry happening on the surface. You have to have a clean metal surface. And this is what really where Anderson uh, excelled because he was clever enough to figure out all the ways and all the things you had to do to get that clean surface. And the first thing you had to do was put the surface inside of some sort of a vacuum system and get rid of the air. <laughs> and that's not easy. And in particular, you have to do it in devices like this. This is one of Anderson's tubes right here. If you go down, if you go up to the, um, what do you call it, the, the lobby, we've got some more of these. You can take a look at them. They are works of art. They literally are works of art. <clears throat> Did Anderson make this one? I don't think so. It's too good. <laughs> <laughs> he was a good glass blower, but he hired professional glass blowers who were able to put these things together. And what you had to do, first of all, was to get rid of all the air that you could by pumping on it through this little guy here. It's like a, it was a tube, an open tube to pumps. And you pumped and pumped and pumped and you heated and heated and heated. You wanted to, you had to heat this to get the gases to come off the walls. You also <coughs> used metal films, which were very reactive to gas, to the gases, oxygen, CO, CO2. That's what this dark stuff is here. That's barium. He loved barium. Barium loves to, to eat gases and keep them there. So you'd do it once, you'd wait a while, it would react, you'd do it again with fresh metal and just keep doing that. Finally, in many cases, your glass blower would start praying you would take this and you would submerge it in liquid nitrogen because that would cool the whole thing and start pumping just because of the cold. And you're pumping things like CO, CO2, water, things like that. Oh, by the way, hydrogen is a, a bugaboo and barium loves hydrogen. So that, that's how you got rid of that. You then use these wires to do your experiment. And I, I, I'm, excuse me, if I may, uh, it's hard for everybody to see this, but <clears throat> there is a magnet here which allows me to swing the sample around and put it into various places to do the experiments. That's, that's how he manipulated for example, right now this surface is gold colored. The way it got gold covered is you brought it over here and you pop this guy on to deposit the gold. Then you wanted to do some other experiment. I don't know if I can get it there or not. It's not a very strong magnet. You brought it over here in front of this guy here. This happens to be an electron gun to do some sort of electron gun experiment on the surface. So the technology that he was developing then led to many other people knowing how to do this. And so that kept the field of surface physics and surface science going. And so it really was a remarkable uh, set. And they broke. <laughs> and, and that's when the glass blower quit praying and started to rebuild it. Don't drop it, Tom. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I'm going to have to skip two thirds of the talk <laughs> <laughs> and uh, take you to, oh, by the way, before I do that, I just want you to know who Jim Anderson is. 
<laughs> he's he's a professor of chemistry, physics. Is that a department? Climate change? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah, he's in charge, by the way, of climate change. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe in climate change? <laughs> uh, anyway, got a, this is at Harvard, and he's got a tremendous program. And uh, without Brian's permission, I've invited him to come back. Brian, is that OK? <laughs> We're going to get him back to have him explain all this stuff to us. OK, so uh, um, let me just go to. Some comments about uh, people like Anderson. I haven't had time to fill you in on uh, Stevenson, who our lectureship is named after, and uh, Bill Band, who is uh, responsible for uh, a real kick in the departmental productivity and so on. And <clears throat> so we're standing on the shoulders of these giants, and we really uh, need to appreciate that because they really set the standards for the future research and teaching in the department. Secondly, <clears throat> they strongly influenced who we hired and uh, supported. We were rarely disappointed, usually we're thrilled by the successes and accomplishments of the newer people. We have a dynamite of a, of a department. And if you go back to my original title, it says small but mighty. We are a small department. And the dean is here. <laughs> <laughs> I once found the data for the size of departments and their ranking. And it, it's a straight line. It's a straight line. So the bigger you are, well, you go down to one. <laughs> so the, the smaller you are, so one, one people, physics departments, nobody ever heard of you. OK, so it really does correlate. And then finally, um, yeah, they've, uh, they are taking us to new heights of accomplishment. And students learn as much as you can from them. Now. Uh, one of the jobs I had, I'll, this is real quick, <clears throat> was I had to give a talk to the new professors, uh, new faculty members at a faculty orientation. So I gave, you know, kind of words of wisdom type of talk. And um, so I told them, you know, some days you're going to have bad boat days. <clears throat> but you, you've got to, uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And so here you are with a barge and a uh, tugboat, and you're approaching a drawbridge. And you ask it to be opened. They deny the request, or they don't get it open in time. You let go of your barge. The barge goes under the bridge. And here you are, nanoseconds from collisions. So what's the message? <laughs> Hang in there. <laughs> and so for all you new people, I want you to hang in there. Just hang in there. And thanks for hanging in with me. Thank you.